بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد This is the fourth lesson speaking about the special night journey of Al Isra Al Mi'raj. Previously, we were speaking about all the special places which the Prophet ﷺ passed by and all the different things he saw and the explanations he got and the many lessons we learned from that. Now we have come to the part of the story when the Prophet ﷺ has entered into Jerusalem and he comes to Masjid Al-Aqsa. So he entered into the city from Babul Yamani, the door which was facing on the right side of the city. And then something very special happened. When he got closer to Masjid Al-Aqsa, and when he, the, the, he was walking through the gate, walking through the door, the Prophet ﷺ looked up, and then he saw Nurani Sati'ani. There were two lights which were shining up to the sky from either side of the Masjid. And then the Prophet ﷺ asked Jibreel salam, ما هذان النوران? That what are these two lights which are shooting to the sky like beams? And then Jibreel salam replied, The light that's on the right side of the masjid, that فَإِنَّهُ مِحْرَابُ أَخِيكَ Dawood. This is the mih where the mihrab of Dawood salam used to be. Mihrab, this, this inset in, in the front of the masjid. So this is where the mihrab of Dawood salam used to be. And the light that's emanating from the left side of the masjid, this is from the grave from your sister Maryam salam, the mother of Isa salam. So just the fact that these lights were emanating from these two sides shows the honor that Allah Ta'ala bestowed on these two individuals. Um, and then something even more special happened. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered the masjid through a door and as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam, they're making their progression through this door then, when he entered through the door, فِيهِ تَمِيلُ shams wal qamar, That the sun and the moon, as they were also in the sky, they tried to peek through the door. So it's as if they were looking down and they were trying to look through that door so they could get a glimpse of Masjid Al-Aqsa. The sun and the moon, even they want to come inside and see what this blessed place looks like. This is how blessed and how sacred Masjid Al-Aqsa is. What happens next? There's two different narrations. One is that Jibreel he came upon a rock that was attached to Bayt al maqdis He put his finger in the rock, which فَخَرَقَهَا It split the rock into two pieces. Then the angel tied the buraq to the rock. And then Wafi the Riwayati Muslim in the other narration, Jibreel he took the buraq, tied it to a ring that was on the outside of Bayt al Maqdis. And this is being uh, narrated, it's the same ring which all the previous Anbiya would tie their animal to when they visited Bayt al Maqdis. And when I visited uh, Bashid al Aqsa, there's, there's a special, a small musalla, a small uh, building. And they name this Masjid al Buraq. And you go downstairs, and there is actually a ring attached to the wall. Some say that this is the same ring. Some say there is no authentic narration which says that this is the ring. But something interesting that, uh, to see if we all visit there. So, all the Prophets, when they came to pay their respects to Masjid al Aqsa, they would tie their animal at the same place. And an interesting <coughs> thing here, this literally ties. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to the same tradition with every single prophet before him. And this is something which he needs because we've mentioned again and again the reason why this special journey is happening right at this specific time because he's at the peak of all of his all of his suffering, all of his pain, and he needs something like this. Now he's being linked directly and this is providing a lot of confidence to him. And another noteworthy thing that Jibril alayhi salam, he was the one tying the animal to the ring, even though Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he was the one riding the buraq, but here Jibreel, the most highest rank, ranking of all the angels, he's doing his service, he's doing his khidmah, which again indicates such a high status of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now they entered the main area of the masjid. Jibreel alayhi sallam told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, هَلْ سَأَلْتَ رَبَّكَ أَيُّرِيَكَ الْحُورَ الْعِينَ 
that did you ask your Lord to introduce you to the, the women of Jannah? And then he replied, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Naam, yes. Jibreel Alayhi Salam then said, These are the women on the side of the masjid. That Fasallim Alayhi Now go and meet them, go and say salam to them. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went and said to salam to the women who were sitting at the side of the masjid. They replied to the salam. And then he asked them, Man and Tunna, that who are all of you? And then فَقُلْنَا They all replied خَيْرَاتٌ حِسَان فَقُلْنَا خَيْرَاتٌ حِسَان This verse from Surah Rahman that we are the good women of Jannah that نِسَاءُ قَوْمٍ أَبْرَار We are the women of men of people who are very righteous أَبْرَار We seek out the company of men who are good and clean and who didn't filthy themselves and they stood firm before Allah and they did not run away from tough situations when things got difficult, when they needed to defend the honor of the Muslims, they needed to defend Islam, they didn't run away. Those kind of men who are good, who are pure and who are brave. The, now the Prophet ﷺ, Jibreel ﷺ, they both pray raka'atain. This is tahiyyatul masjid, which is a sunnah. When we enter the masjid, we pray two raka'ah. And they were not in the masjid for long until suddenly the masjid became flooded with people. So many people were entering the masjid. And then the Prophet said, The Prophet is looking around and he starts to recognize that these are actually prophets. These are some people that I know, some are praying, some are in rukur, some are in sujood, and they were all offering tahiyyatul masjid. They were all offering two raka'ah, entering the masjid. The adhan was called, the iqama was called, and this is one. All the prophets, they stood up and they're looking around, asking who's going to lead the salah? Who is going to be our imam? And now there's three different narrations of what happens next. One of them, Jibreel he took the Prophet by his hand and took him forward to the front of the masjid. And this is when the Prophet he led all the other anbiya in salah. Wafi riwayatin, another narration. The prophets, they started to ask, the, like arguing, they say, no, you should lead. No, maybe you should lead. Maybe it should be Ibrahim, or it should be Musa, it should be Isa. They, they were telling each other that you go forward and lead the salah until finally they reached a consensus. They decided that it should be none other than Muhammad وسلم, who is to lead us in salah. In a third narration, Jibreel, it was um, Jibreel salam, himself, he called the Adhan and the angels they descended from the sky and all the other prophets of the past, they were escorted by these angels into the masjid. And then all these angels, they also joined in and they joined in with the salah. So it wasn't just the prophets, it was angels, the same angels that escorted different anbiya to the masjid. But all three narrations agree that it was Prophet Muhammad wasallam who led every single prophet in salah, in Bayt al-Maqdis. Now it's a sunnah that whenever the Prophet ﷺ would finish salah, he would turn and he would face his congregation. So following the same habit, this is what he did, he turned around. And then he, uh, Jibreel ﷺ asked that, Ya Muhammad, atadri man salla khalfaka? Do you know who just prayed behind you? And then the Prophet ﷺ said, no. Before this, he recognized a few of them, but he didn't know who everyone was. This is when Jibreel alayhi salam replied, Kullu, that who prayed behind you, Kullu nabiyyin ba'athahu Allahu ta'ala. Every single prophet that Allah ever sent to this world has just prayed behind you in salah. How many prophets were there? The riwayah in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, it's written that there's over 125,000 prophets. And in another narration, in the same chapter, narrated by Abu Hayr it says that Allah Ta'ala sent over 300,000 prophets in the same chapter, subhanAllah. Now after the salah is done, all the different prophets, they started to speak and they started to praise Allah Ta'ala and thank Allah for all the blessings that he had gave. It's like a speaker's panel happened. Now one by one, they're all taking turns. So first, it was Ibrahim alayhi salam. He spoke and he said, Alhamdulillah, ladhi ittakhadhani uh, khalila wa a'tani um, mulkan azima. That all the praises are for Allah who took me as his best friend. He granted me a very vast kingdom and he made uh, me a, a nation that is subservient to him. I was followed by mankind and he saved me and protected me from the fire. Meaning uh, the fire that was lit to, they tried to punish him and uh, all of these things. 
um, after he destroyed the idols, and he said, he, and he made it cool and peaceful for me. Then Musa alayhi salam, he started speaking, and he said, Alhamdulillah, ladhi kallamani taklima, all praise for Allah who directly spoke to me, and he made me the means of destroying Fir'aun, and he made me the direct means of saving Banu Israel. And he made from my followers people who followed the truth, and they established justice from that truth. Then Dawood salam spoke and he said, Alhamdulillah, ladhi ja'ala li mulkan azima wa allamani zabur that all praises for Allah who made me a vast, great, powerful kingdom. And he taught me the sacred text of Dawood, uh, sorry, of David, uh, the Zabur, the Psalms. And he made iron very soft in my hands. He could bend iron. And he made the mountains submissive before me so that when I praised Allah, the mountains and the bird, they praised Allah along with me. And he granted me wisdom and the ability to address the people correctly. Then Suleiman spoke. Alhamdulillah, Alladi Sakhara li riyah wa Sakhara li shayateen ya'maluna li ma shit min mahari wa tamathil wa jifan in kal jawab wa quduri rasiyat. That all praises for Allah who made submissive to me the winds. And he put the shaitan under my control and he put human beings under my command and they would do things whatever I wanted to do from building sculptures and, and palaces. Um, diving into the ocean, bringing up pearls, gems, minerals. He taught me the speech of birds. He could communicate with the birds. He understood them and animals. And he granted me more than you can imagine from each and every single type of thing. And he put under my control the armies of the jinn and human beings and birds. And he granted me virtue over many of his believing slaves. And he granted me such a kingdom that it is not fit for anyone after me. And he made me such a beautiful kingdom that there was no there was no restriction in it, nor was there any bad outcome from it. Then Isa alayhi salam spoke, Alhamdulillah, Jalani Kalimatahu wa Jala Mithli Mithli Adam Khalakahumin Tural Thumma Kalahu Kun Fayakun that all praises for Allah who made me his kalima, made me his word. This is an expression used in the Quran, meaning that Isa alayhi salam, he's the this, uh, the miraculous manifestation of the command of Allah that he he carries on that he made my example the example of Adam like just like how Adam alayhi salam, he was given life it was a miracle no father no mother in a similar way Isa alayhi salam, he was given life he was born without a father Allah taught me the book meaning the Injil and the wisdom and he made me such that I was able to cure someone who was born blind I'm able to cure the leper and I'm able to revive the dead all by the command of Allah. And he elevated me and he raised me and he purified me. And Allah protected me and my mother from shaitan was dejected and shaitan never had any access to us. Then finally, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he spoke and he said that فَكَلَّمَكُمْ أَثْنَى عَلَىٰ رَبِّي Each and every single one of you has praised your Lord. وَإِنِّي uh, uh, Muthnin ala Rabbi Azza wa Jal, and now I will praise my Lord. Faqal, he said, Alhamdulillah, ladi arsalani rahmatulil alameen. All praises for Allah who sent me as a mercy for all of mankind. Wa kafatil linnas, bashira wa nadira. And he made me for all of mankind a deliverer of good news, a congratulator to mankind, and a warner to mankind. Wa anzala ala al furqan, fihi bayan li kulli shay. And he revealed the furqan. The Quran, which is this, Furqan means the distinguisher between what is right and what is wrong. It clearly defines everything. And he made my followers the best of nations. Uh, they were brought out to benefit the mankind. And he made my nation a balanced people. And he made my followers the first and the last. Meaning the first that will enter paradise, but the last ummah that was sent to this world. And he expanded my chest. He opened my chest, meaning he gave me, made things clear for me. He gave me confidence and um, he moved, removed burdens from me, meaning he lightened my Lord. Allah, Allah Ta'ala helped me. And he elevated my mention. So when any... Whenever a believer mention my names, they will all mention my name. They will all say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَجَعَلَنِي فَاتِحًا وَخَاتِمًا And he made me the opener, meaning he opened the deen of Allah to the entire world. Like wherever you go in the world, 
Even countries that we've probably never hear, heard of, you will always find Muslims there. You will find people praying there. And wa khatiman, but at the same time, he made me a seal of prophethood, the last prophet to be sent. And this is when Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said, Bihada fadalakum Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is why Muhammad has the most virtue amongst all of you. This is why Allah has chosen him for this special task. So this is like, we'll just pause here for, for a second. Something so special has just happened here. Like we're amazed just by reading it and hearing it. Imagine being there. And this is at a time, remember, when so much difficult, years and years of pain, of difficulties, of trials, of tribulations that he's been dealing with in Makkah. Because remember, he's not migrated to Medina. This is around a year before Hijrah. So it must have been such a hard lifting experience for him, really gave him confidence. And he's in the same room of all the prophets that ever existed. And not just in the same room, for him to lead all of them in Salah. And then finally, a man that he looked up to, Ibrahim alayhi salam, like he's the acceptance of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He's continuing his legacy. And then it was Ibrahim alayhi salam who set the foundation for him to come and now complete. It was him that was praising the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was calling him that, you know, you are, um, 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 this is why you are so special, you're so praiseworthy. Um, and imagine how much of a powerful experience that was for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, there's still a discussion going on. They're still sat there, all the Anbiya, they're talking amongst themselves. And then they start talking about the Sa'a, the final hour, the end of times, the day of judgment. And then, you know, they, they, um, they looked at Ibrahim Ali salam and said, why don't you tell us? What do you think about the day of judgment? When is the day of judgment? Then Ibrahim Ali salam said, I have no knowledge of when the day of judgment will occur. And so then they, they turned to Musa Ali salam. They asked him, like, tell us something about the Day of Judgment. And he replied the same thing. I have no ilm of when the Day of Judgment will occur. And then the prophets, they turned to Isa alayhi salam. And Isa alayhi salam, he said, I have no knowledge of when the Day of Judgment will occur, except for Allah. But now he adds something else here. Because Isa alayhi salam, he will play a major role in all the events that will unfold towards the end of time, the signs of Qiyamah. So he starts to explain a few more things. What did he say? He said, وَفِيهَا عَهِدَ يَا إِلَيَّ رَبِّي أَنَّ الدَّجَّالَ خَارِجِ From what my Lord has told me, the Dajjal will come. وَمَعِيَ قَضِيبَانِ And I will have two sticks when he sees me. فَإِذَا رَآنِ ذَابَ كَمَا يَذُوبُ الرَّصَّاسِ When he sees me, he will melt just like iron melts when it's put in fire. قَالَ And then he carries on. فيهلكه الله إذا رآني الله will destroy him when he sees me so much حتى إن الحجرة والشجرة يقول stones and and trees they will say at that time that يا مسلم إن تحتي كافر the oh believer there is a there's a disbeliever under me فتعالى فقتله سكم and destroy him قال فيهلكهم الله الله will then destroy the people who oppose the truth ثم يرجع الناس إلى بلادهم وطانهم until the people will return back to their homes and their lands قال فعند ذلك يخرج يا جوج وما جوج the people they will enjoy peace for some time until يا جوج وما جوج will come out وهم من كل حدب ينسلون from every hill you will see them flowing down waves and waves of them will be coming and rushing down فَيَطَعُونَ بِلَادَهُمْ لَا يَأْتُونَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ إِلَّا أَهْلَكُوا They will crush and crumble every part of the land, destroy everything. وَلَا يَمُرُّونَ عَلَى مَا إِلَّا شَرِبُوا Whenever they come across water, they will destroy it, meaning they will drink all of the water, consume all of it. قَالَ ثُمَّ يَرْجِعُ النَّاسِ إِلَيَّ يَشْكُونَهُمْ Then the people will they'll come back to me and they'll be complaining to me. And then uh, they will, uh, you know, complain that please ask Allah for some help. For um, Allah alayhim, then I will make du'a to Allah against this creation. There's another narration which says that believers that they, they will run up to the mountains and they will they will find a place to hide and escape. But eventually they will grow tired of living there. Things will get too difficult. There will be no food left, and then they will complain to Isa alayhi salam. Then he will make du'a. Then when he makes dua, then فَيُهْلِكُهُمْ وَيُمِيتُهُمْ Allah will destroy the creation. 
But remember, there's like thousands, millions of them. So the entire earth will be covered with dead bodies of Yajuj and Majuj. And the earth will stink of them. And then another narration says, birds will come and pick up the dead bodies and throw them into the ocean. And then, وَيُنَزِّلُ اللَّهُ الْمَطْرَ فَيَجْتَرِفُ أَجْسَادَهُمْ حَتَّى يَقْذِفُهُمْ فِي الْبَحْرِ It will continuously rain and this will cleanse the earth and their bodies will be thrown into the ocean. فَفِيمَا عَهِدَ إِلَيَّ رَبِّي أَنَّ ذَلِكَ إِذَا كَانَ ذَلِكَ Then my Lord told me that after all this has happened أَنَّ السَّاعَةَ كَالْحَامِلْ المتم. The day of judgment will be like a pregnant female whose pregnancy has come to an end. لا يدري أهلها متى تفجأهم بوالدها ليلا أو نهارا That the family of the woman don't know when they'll be surprised by the birth of the child. Maybe it's going to come in the daytime, maybe it's going to come at night. That's how close the day of judgment will be at that time. Like at any moment, the final hour will come. So after this conversation, the Prophet ﷺ, he sat in Baytul Maqdis for a bit longer. Suddenly he became very thirsty and he says that he recalls he had never felt such a thirst in, in, in his, his entire life. And remember, he used to live in the desert. He's used to hot, used to thirst, but he never felt any thirst like this. Then three bowls or three cups were brought and they were placed in a row in front of the Prophet Sallallahu and all the bowls they were, one narration says they were covered. So one, um, there was one on the right, one in the middle, one on the left. And then the Prophet Sallallahu he took the first bowl which was on the right side and he drank from it. This bowl had honey in it. And then he took a small sip of honey and then he put it back down. And then he took the second bowl which was in the middle and he realized that it had milk inside it. So he drank the entire bowl of milk until he became full and then he put the bowl down. And the third bowl was offered to him, but the Prophet ﷺ, he doesn't even touch the bowl. He doesn't even want to look at the bowl. He declines and he says, no, it's okay, I'm, I'm full. I don't, need to, I don't need to have anything from that. So Ibrahim ﷺ, he was watching all of this. Um, and Ibrahim ﷺ, because obviously the Prophet ﷺ saw him, spoke with him. He was describing what he looked like. He was described as an elderly, handsome, honorable, and distinguished looking man. And he said to the Prophet ﷺ that you have done the right thing. That you did the right thing here. That, and then Jibreel alayhi salam, فَضَرِبَ مَنْ كِبَيْهِ That he grabbed the Prophet sallallahu by the shoulders and he, it says he hit him but means he, he patted him like he was congratulating him. Because they've got like a, a different, they've got their friends here. They're, they're, they've got different friendship just like you would hit someone's back just congratulating him. And then Jibreel alayhi salam said قَدْ أَصَبْتَ That twice he said you've done uh, what was right. You have done what was right. And then he explained that the first bowl which you had, had honey. You took, took a little bit from it, then uh, you, um, you put it down. If you had drunk, uh, took more, meaning if you had indulged into the honey and had more, then your ummah would have drowned into the desires and materialism of the world. This sweet honey was a, rep a representative of the, all the sweet, all the glamour, all of the glitz of the dunya, um, meaning that your ummah is meant to take this sweetness in moderation. Like the dunya, we were meant to, uh, we, we live in the dunya, we, we take the dunya, we, t we use the dunya, but we just take a little bit, what we need. Like we were meant to eat to live, not live to eat. But unfortunately, it's, it's becoming the other way around. Then Jibreel Al -Islam continued, the middle bowl had milk, which was representing guidance, hidayah, uh, and all the khair, all the good, the deen of Allah. Your ummah will enjoy the guidance of Allah since you drank the milk to its fill. And then an interesting thing about milk, like when the Prophet ﷺ ate food, he would thank Allah, he would praise Allah. Alhamdulillah, amana wa saqana wa ja'al when someone gave him food, Allah ma atti man at'amani. Uh, we'll drink water, alhamdulillah, uh, saqana adbun firatun So he would always thank Allah. But milk, there was a different dua. There's a unique dua just for milk. That Allahumma barik lana fi wa zidna min. 
He would thank Allah, but ask Allah to increase the, the barakah. Give me more milk. Give me barakah. So it's some, it shows that milk is something special. And many um, sahaba, multiple genes, for example, Umar bin Khattab, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhum, even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they would sometimes see in their dreams that they were drinking milk. This means that milk is a representative of, of ilm, of hidayah, of khair, good things. So Jibreel alayhi salam continued the third bowl, which you didn't even touch. And if we go by the narration that the bowls were covered, he didn't even know what was inside it. Like he just rejected it. This had wine, this had alcohol. You didn't even feel the need to look inside it. If you had, would have taken this, your ummah would have become lost and misguided. And one narration says, the people would not believe in you except just for a few people, if you drank what was inside that bowl. So khamar, it's a representative of any kind of evil, any kind of batil. And there's many lessons we can learn. Just a simple thing here, three bowls, so, you know, he was drinking from them. That the three elements that exist in the dunya. So the first one being obviously the deen, the deen, the Quran, the sunnah, all of the good things, like how we identify. This is the basis, this is the foundation, this is the good which we should be having. The second thing is the things which are mubah, you know, the oil, sorry, the, 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 um, the honey. He consumed it, but not too much. Then he puts it back. These are the permissible things. Halal, mubah. These things we should take, but only that which we need. We don't need to take everything just because it's halal. And we've been granted a leeway how much we can take, how much we can interact, interact with. The third thing that exists is the, uh, the things which are impermissible, the things which are haram. And the default Islamic ruling for, uh, ruling for things, things are permissible, but the, the things which are haram, impermissible, these are actually a minority of things. It's actually only a few things compared to all the things which are mubah, permissible. Uh, um, and this, the uh, wine, um, uh, khamar was representing these things. So this is our task as well. He didn't even look at the bowl. He didn't even touch the bowl which had wine in. Meaning, haram things, we're not meant to try them. We're not meant to go near them. Then maybe I'll try, maybe I'll just take a tiny bit. Like some, some people say, okay, alcohol, it's impermissible to drink, but maybe I can sell it. You know, maybe I can, you know, uh, um, serve it. You know, we, we, many people, they try to get so close to haram and, and justified in a way, but we have to look at the example of the Prophet Sallallahu He didn't even touch that ball. He didn't even want to look what was inside it. And this is the, his methodology. Never mind, like, don't take it, don't hold it, don't even go near it. That's what we, sh that should be our approach to anything which is haram. But even in the things which are permissible, moderation. The Prophet Sallallahu how much honey did he consume? Just a sip. He just took a tiny bit. If, if things which are hal uh, halal, mubah, if we indulge in them too much, we overindulge, then it could actually lead to harm. And this is the principle which, which we need to understand. For example, in the Quran, kulu wa shrabu wa la tusrifu. Eat, drink, but, but don't be excessive. Don't have too much. Don't overindulge. Don't waste. The Prophet ﷺ taught us that indulging in something, initially it can be good, there's benefit, but if we have too much, then it leads to harm, it becomes harmful. The only thing which is inherently good, that there's only goodness inside it in, and nothing else, no matter how much you engage, no matter how much you consume, is the deen of Allah Ta'ala. This, there's no limit to it. We can do as much um, learning, as much studying, as much praying, as much Qur'an, as much adhkar, there will be no harm. But things which are permissible, there's a limit. It can become harmful. So these three elements, these are the three elements of the dunya which we're living in. The Prophet Sallallahu he taught us on that beautiful night how to interact with the dunya, what to prioritize, what we should be indulging in. The honey, he took a little bit, but when it came to the milk, he drank as much as he could. When it's deen, when it's Islamic things, we shouldn't be limiting ourselves. Take as much as we can, learn as much as we can, read as much as we can. But we do the opposite. We limit our, you know, done enough praying today, enough masjid today, enough adhkar today, I've listened to much Quran today, now I need to listen to it. We limit things. He drank as much milk as he could. No limit whatsoever. When it comes to the luxuries of the world, 
if it's permissible, it's fine. We use it for our needs, our necessities. Never overindulge in these things. And the alcohol representing evil in the world, he didn't even go near it. So this is a lesson how we should be living our life. Now comes the part of the story where he's presented like a special staircase comes down and he recalls he's never seen any staircase like this in his life. And he describes what it was made of and what it looks like um, and how he would, be, would, would climb the stairs and even more interesting thing he sees. And this is the beginning of the story of Al-Mi'raj. All of this, these past four sessions was just Al-Isra. Now it's Al-Mi'raj where he ascends to the heavens and so many um, amazing things happen. But the one thing which we should take away from all the lessons, the sanctity and how special Masjid Al-Aqsa is. We say it again and again. The, the, the conclusion of this journey was to meet Allah Ta'ala, have a special meeting with Allah and to receive the gift of Salah. He could have done this directly from Makkah. They didn't need to go Masjid Al-Aqsa, but on purpose, Allah wanted him to go to Masjid Al-Aqsa, pray in Masjid Al-Aqsa and every other prophet, their souls to be there at that time. To show us, we learn a lesson of how significant this place is. Masjid Al-Aqsa is the third holiest masjid, but it's unique in so many ways that even the Haramain Sharif and they don't have this same kind of status and uniqueness. This is the, um, uh, the, the, where every single prophet was gathered and they all prayed there. And if we th take the one narration, they, they were all escorted there by different, different angels. And all the angels, they also... Um, uh, part, uh, partook in that prayer, in that salah. So which should create this love in our hearts for Masjid Al-Aqsa. When we have that love, then we will have true concern about what's happening there. Uh, normally, like there's, there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands which like to pray there, especially on Jummah. We see now there are only a, a few thousand people, which is absolutely nothing they're allowed to pray. They're, they're imposing heavy, heavy restrictions. It was already heavily restricted. There are people who live in that area who have never prayed there and probably will never be allowed. But the ones that are, are allowed, now even they're restricted. But the last thing we want is Aqsa to be taken from our hands and taken from the Muslims. So not only do we have to make so much dua, for Masjid Al-Aqsa and uh, Al-Quds, Sham, all of that area. But make a strong intention to visit Bayt Al-Maqdis. Any one of us that haven't visited there, we should. We shouldn't. It was a yearning that for every prophet to visit. And many of them travel there. Many of them live there. Many of them passed away there. But us, like they traveled. How difficult must it have been traveled? Days and weeks of traveling, of walking, going on the, the camel, going on the, the, you know, whatever ride they had. We just need to book a flight, book a flight, book a hotel, go there a few hundred pounds. And, but still, for some reason, we don't go. For, I don't know why, but the majority of us don't go and probably have no intention to go. So we should really have an intention to benefit Masjid Al-Aqsa and the, the Palestinians there in every way we can, that by donating, by raising awareness, uh, by protesting, by making dua, by rectifying ourselves, but by traveling there as well. When I traveled there, nearly every single person I met, they said that we don't want anything from you. We don't want money. To, we just want you to keep visiting. We want you to keep coming here. And that's all they need. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept every single one of us to visit Masjid al-Aqsa, to pray in Masjid al-Aqsa. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help all of our Muslim brothers and sisters who are suffering there. Ameen wa akhru da'wan. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khair khalqi Muhammad wa ala ahli sahabi ajma'in. Ameen. Uh, why in this story Sayyidina Nuh is not mentioned? Which, which Prophet? Sayyidina Nuh Because we're all family from Nuh after the two friends. Mm -hmm. It's not been mentioned in this story. You can mention it for us in here. Yeah. Many things are not mentioned in here. Asking, I, the, 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 the book I was reading, that narration wasn't in there. Because we are from the son of Sheep, you know, no. Salam. No. And we all come from his family. No. Mm. Yeah, in this, there's... Too many different versions. Yeah, there's this, this, even what I'm saying, there's even more things that happened. But obviously, I'm trying to just take from whatever authentic places I can. Many things I've missed out, but Allah Ta'ala accept, inshallah. Ameen.
جزاك الله خير جزاك الله خير وإياك بارك الله فيك